Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back with another round of Deep Space News updates. Uh, so yeah, it's January 7th and the, the year 2021 ended with uh, Iran making the final launch attempt of the year with their Seamorg rocket. I have a whole separate video on that where I totally mispronounced its name as Cymorg the whole time, but now I've learned. Uh, but yes, that did cap off a bumper 2021 which set records for both number of rocket launches and number of successes. There were 144 launch attempts, uh, although that might be a little higher because there was a few that were done in secret. Yes, I'm looking at you, Iran. Uh, but there was only 133 successes. Right, so that beat out 1967, which had had 139 launch attempts, but only 122 successes. And 1976, which had 125 successes, from 131 successes. So, you know, this is just basically showing that space is rapidly growing. And, you know, the number of satellites last year was obviously really huge because of Starlink. And that brings me to the first launch of 2022. The Falcon 9 Starlink is, uh, they launched 49 satellites again to the standard Starlink orbit, which is a 53.2 degree inclination, but they took a different launch uh, trajectory in this case. So normally, when they're launching to this orbit, they launch north out of uh, the Cape. Instead, they launched eastward or southeast and landed on the barge and then proceeded to make a bit of a dogleg turn to get around Bahamas. So this is, they're doing this because during the winter, the weather in the North Atlantic is a whole lot worse. So by moving the, uh, doing the barge to the south, that means they're in better conditions. And obviously that makes a big difference uh, when you saw what happened to the last booster recovered last year that just got beat around on the deck of the barge. So yeah, they can launch um, to an orientation of 120 degree azimuth and that allows them to reach an orbit of 40 degrees. That means that after they separate, they have to turn and perform a bit of a dogleg maneuver. So the downside of this is that they have to use fuel that they wouldn't need on previous launches. So they lose maybe about a 1,000 kilograms. So they lose maybe four or five satellites from their uh, payload. They only launched 49 on this. And according to Elon, by the way, these are equipped with the laser in interconnect. So these are definitely new generation Starlink. But yes, uh, first launch of the year, successful. And they're gonna be doing this a whole lot more for Starlink uh, during the early part of this year. Another launch that happened a uh, couple of days ago, not a space launch, although it did technically go to space. North Korea had a missile test and everybody is saying, oh my God, it's a hypersonic weapons test. And yes, technically it's a hypersonic weapon because anything that goes to near orbital velocity is going at hypersonic speeds. Basically ICBMs from the 1950s are technically hypersonic weapons. See, people hear hypersonic and they think, oh, that means it goes really fast because that's faster than supersonic. No, no. The thing about hypersonics is there, it means maneuverability. It means that they can turn inside the atmosphere. And that's what this is. This is a maneuverable re-entry vehicle. It goes through space like a ballistic missile, hits the atmosphere and then glides and it can deploy in either direction to hit a target. And the advantage is that this makes terminal phase intercept harder because you don't know necessarily where it's going until uh, you know it's too late. You can still intercept in the mid-course, and that's what the US is, of course, looking at with their mid-course uh, you know, interception system. But anyway, yeah, sure, there's a lot of noise about this, but you know what? The US has had a hypersonic, you know, maneuverable re-entry vehicles since the 1980s. Like, most countries have maneuverable re-entry vehicles, I believe. Like, it's, it's surprisingly common. I think even South Korea has it, and they're not exactly known for big ballistic missile shenanigans. Anyway, um... More regular space news. Uh, they, I believe it's now, they have now sold all of the Ariane 5 launches to all their, the customers. There are five Ariane 5 launches remaining on the calendar. The final launch we know is going to be JUICE, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, Explorer mission. Um, and we expect Ariane 6 to have its debut flight in the second half of 2022. So, yeah, there, we don't know which customers are going on which flight. We just do know that it has joined the Atlas V and the Delta IV as sold out, can't get them anymore. Uh, in 2022, Ariane Space is expecting to launch four Ariane 5, three Vega, uh, one Ariane 6, and nine Soyuz, which is kind of interesting because ostensibly they're supposed to be Europe's launch provider, 
but more than half of their launches are coming on Russian-built launch vehicles. Uh, yeah, and of course the last payload that was launched by Ariane Space was the James Webb Space Telescope and everybody has been watching this as it's been unfolding and tensioning and right now we're in a really good state. We've confirmed the sun shield is all tensioned, everything's been deployed. The secondary mirror has folded out and locked into position. So at this point now we have a functioning telescope. We're still waiting for the side uh, panels to fold out and provide a larger mirror. But even at this point, if those lock in place, you would still have a functioning telescope, right? The, uh, you know, the whatever, the, the momentum panel has deployed, the thermal radiator, like everything's looking good. So that's all great. And of course, everybody's saying, why don't we have cameras to watch this thing? And look, the real the reason is that the dark side of the sun shield is dark and it's cold, and most cameras wouldn't do that very well. Now, to be fair, SpaceX, for example, shows that you can have cameras looking inside the liquid oxygen tank, which is even colder and darker. They use this technology called light, but I think having lights on the far side of the sun shield, well, you know, you could imagine some horror uh, failure scenario where the lights get stuck on or something. Anyway, look, they don't need them. NASA has been historically not happy with putting engineering cameras everywhere, so you know, we'll just have to live with it. Um, let me see, down in Boca Chica, yes. Um, of course, they're still continuing to build. We heard that the environmental report has been pushed back, but we're, we're seeing the first signs of life on the chopsticks, right? These are the things that attach to the, the launch tower and the landing tower. They're supposed to catch the booster as it comes down. They, they're these like chopstick style devices, except they're, you know, 100 feet long and able to carry tons of material. Um, so now they're moving up and down and moving in and out. And I hope that they will move a lot faster when a booster is coming in, because right now they're looking rather sedate. And by the way, this particular design, I predicted it in Kerbal Space Program a year ago when uh, you know Elon was talking about catching boosters. Difference is I had to play the footage in reverse to make it work. Uh, yeah, okay. Back in the US, oh yeah, in New York, Virgin Orbit rung the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange. And I, it's looking to me like this may be the sort of tail end of the recent wave of space uh, SPACs, as they say, special act power or whatever, acquisition, special purpose acquisition corporations. I, I think that, you know, space, everyone wanted a piece of SpaceX, but SpaceX hasn't really been accepting investors except from certain very powerful groups and most investors are locked out of SpaceX. So there's been demand to in, you know, invest in space and this whole SPAC thing has been a mechanism by which people have got money into uh, Astra, uh, Rocket Lab, Virgin Orbit. Those are the main ones I can think of. And so Virgin Orbit, they announced that they expected a $483 million payout from this. And it's ended up as being only 228 million because the way these things are structured is if you put money into the SPAC and they're like, we're going to put money in, you know, this company that you have no faith in, you can ha ask for your money back. So apparently a lot of money was taken back uh, because people didn't want to be involved in another space thing. So yeah, um, all the same, they do have more money in hand and that will help them work with their ongoing operations. Virgin Orbit does have a launch next week. It's called Above the Clouds. Uh, it's going to be on the 12th. It'll have eight small satellites for the Department of Defense and a couple of Stork satellites by a Polish company called Sat Revolution, which reminds me, Poland can into space, right? <laughs> Which you may or may not know that meme, but meme. But during, yeah, I forgot about this. Uh, December, there was the finals of the second Hack a Sat competition. So this is a, what's called a capture the flag event. This is a, a hacker competition. This generally happens at all sorts of conventions where InfoSec people try to show their computer skills by uh, performing all sorts of pre-planned you know, puzzles to break into computers and make them do cool stuff. Hackasat version one was a couple of years ago at DEF CON and Hackasat two just happened. Now the idea is that uh, obviously this works very well because hacking satellites is a remote event, which works very well given the current um, pandemic situation. 
But yeah, they would have these satellites which were simulated to be on orbit with limited communication windows. And they would have obviously copies of the satellite that they could test and, and work with. And so a whole bunch of teams took part trying to demonstrate their ability to hack into these and perhaps learn some skills. This is something that's run by uh, the Department of Defense as a sort of you know, way to learn about satellite security and get people experienced in it. Uh, I believe it's officially the Air Force Research Laboratory with uh, Space Force that's doing this. But yeah, the three winners of the three top teams were Solar Wine in first place, Poland, Can Into Space, and Dice Gang. But unfortunately, since the competition finished, there has been a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth and concern over the, the scoring being rather opaque and nobody quite understanding what they were doing right or wrong. So I'm hoping that that can be resolved and we can continue hacking satellites in the future. It, there, was, there was some interesting uh, you know, talks and stuff that came out of that for sure. This week, NASA announced Callisto, a technology demonstration which will fly on Artemis 1. This is basically Siri for a spaceship, right? Although technically it's running on Alexa. But look, uh, the, yeah, this is like HAL. Uh, and so it's a technology demonstrator that's been put together by Lockheed Martin. It works with Cisco to provide WebEx video conferencing. It uses Alexa for like voice command backend running on a local server. And it then has a, an iPad Pro as a primary interface that's plugging into all of these things. Now you might say, well, why are they not using Siri? Because Siri's on the iPad. I don't know. I think what happened was they started with Alexa and then they looked at tablets and they found that the iPad Pro was the best one. Like, I think in terms, I mean, and when I say the best one, they probably tested like accessibility because there's not going to be a person there that is able to reboot it. This is going to be flying on a mission with no crew and it'll have to respond to voice comms from the cabin. But also, I think they probably tested things like radiation hardening because this will be the first piece of consumer electronics headed outside of the Van Allen belt. So it'll be really interesting to see if, uh, you know, this hardware can actually handle it just fine. Yeah, that's one that, uh, Definitely a little bit of me going up in that one. And uh, remember about a month ago when we were all excited about the mystery hut on the moon that the Chinese U2 rover was seeing? Well, we just got some close-up photos. Can you guess what it is? Of course it's a rock, right? It's, it's a rock sitting on the side of a crater and the shadow just happens to make it look like it had a front door. Also, it was way closer than people expected. So yeah, it's a rock called Jade Rabbit. Good for it. Uh, China also, again, something I didn't talk about, I should have talked about earlier, China, China complained that they've had to maneuver the Tiangong space station to avoid close approaches with Starlink satellites. This happened in like Jan, uh, June and October last year, and they basically submitted a formal statement to the United Nations. Now, um, this is unusual because these statements are actually what they're supposed to be doing it for is basically, we launch this, watch out for it. Whereas in this case, it was more, you guys are doing this and we don't like it. Um, so yes, it does turn out that there were two Starlink satellites. One was being decommissioned and coming down and the other one was going up. And both of them came close to the Chinese space station. Now, China said they maneuvered. And if you look at the elements, you can see those maneuvers. You can also see in these charts by Jonathan McDowell that... In one case, the Starlink satellite clearly maneuvered as well, but that wasn't communicated. Um, and in the other case, the Starlink satellite just kept going up. But in both cases, uh, the 18th Space Control Squadron said there was no chance of a collision in either case, right? And, you know, when you look at the charts and you see, well, but it, it looked like they were going to come within a few kilometers. Surely when you're moving at seven kilometers per second, coming within half a second of a collision is hugely dangerous. And that's sort of true, except that's a very naive view of the situation. Because when you're in orbit, horizontal distance is much more fuzzy. Vertical distance is much more precise because satellites can't change their altitude very quickly, at least without propulsion, right? So, for example, the, pizza, the ISS has a region called the pizza box, right? This is an area of space that if any satellite is going to come into it, they have to do collision avoidance maneuvers. And that box is like 50 kilometers across from one side to the other, 20 plus or minus 25, um, 50 kilometers along the direction of the orbit, and one kilometer thick. 
right? So it's a pizza box shape. It's very flat because you could have something come within one, just over one kilometer from the space station and it wouldn't really be any concern because you're pretty much guaranteed that that one kilometer difference isn't going to change by a whole lot. I don't know the exact parameters of this enc these encounters, but obviously, you know, obviously there's going to be a lot more of these things going forwards because we're going to have more and more satellites and there is going to be, uh, there may have to be changes in the way space is managed where there may have to be more um, transparency regarding future flight plans because uh, like I think the the Starlink, the one where it was ascending, it was very clear it didn't even need to bother changing its course but if you assume that it stopped ascending at one point then it could potentially have been in a position to uh, get home close to Tiangong. But clearly that was never the plan. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Okay, and so one of the really big pieces of news in the last week has been the unrest in Kazakhstan, which is uh, obviously space adjacent because Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, Russia st still very much relies on those launch facilities for the International Space Station. And unrest in that country um, could be problematic. As it stands right now, there were initially peaceful protests over, you know, things like fuel prices. There was violence, things were burned, and uh, apparently Russian armed forces have been brought in to uh, restore order, and unfortunately lots of people have been killed. So I just, yeah, I don't see uh, this changing the leadership by any means. Uh, you know, the Kazakh leadership very much has its roots in Soviet era leadership. Like, it's it's kind of wild if you look back. Uh, yeah, I mean, the next launch from Kazakhstan, uh, from Baikonur, will be a Soyuz in uh, carrying a progress in mid-February. That'll be going to the International Space Station, obviously. Uh, an interesting data point that resulted from this is that apparently, I read somewhere that like 18% of Bitcoin mining dropped off the planet when Kazakhstan shut down its internet this week. And I hear what happened was that in China, they shut down, you know, basically made it illegal to mine crypto. And a lot of the people in the you near know, the Kazakh border just moved across into Kazakhstan and started up there because, hey, Kazakhstan actually has a lot of oil reserves. And so, you know, power. But then, now I'm wondering, do the increased fuel prices that caused the riots, do those have any link to the power that was being needed to mine crypto? I don't know. Uh, and also that leads into the other story is that there was a mystery bidder who paid $28 million to fly on Blue Origin's debut flight with Jeff Bezos. He has revealed himself as uh, Justin Sun, who's a crypto pioneer, evangelist, and founder of the Tron blockchain platform. Uh, now he has uh, basically he's figured out his situation and he's putting together a crew of his own, a mission he calls the Sea of Stars. He's going to pick five other people to fly with him on a short flight to space. And of course he's, you know, picking people that are cool in his eyes, crypto pioneers and tech people and celebrities and metaverse and artists. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, but that'll be an interesting one to see just who he picks, to be honest. So yeah, that is my eight or so days, my deep space updates. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.